So we, we got back to um, Antelope, rejigged all our kit. And it's only then, um, your previous question, is when I began to think of what we'd just done. Because the, um, the tea I was drinking, there was, there was waves in the tea, you know, because it all dawned on us, both of us, what we'd just been involved with and the risk, you know. You don't think of that at the time because your training kicks in. And it was then that I thought, you know, and everybody was saying, well done, and all these things. So we, we were full of, um, full of joys of spring. And we just sat there then sorting ourselves out, waiting for the next, next job, which came next morning. We got a message. You wanted to go back to Argonaut. They need help again. So, okay, Forward Magazine. We know what the problem will be. We put all the kit in our, in our rucksacks. Scrounge the lift back to Argonaut. When we arrived at Argonaut, oh, no, no, you're not wanted here. You needed an antelope. Antelope's got it, unexploded bombs on board. So I had to scrounge another lift from Argonaut to Antelope. Anybody going near Antelope, etc. on the radio, and they come and picked us up. And we were taken to Antelope, HMS Antelope. This is the Saturday, sorry, this is Sunday the 23rd of, of May. And as we approached Antelope, I could see the hole in the side of the ship. And I knew there was one on the other side, because I'd been told there was two bombs on board. And I turned to Jim and I said, it's the same as what we dealt with yesterday, Jim. Because you could tell by the diameter of hole of entry what the, um, what the size of the diameter of the bomb is, which gives you an indication of size. Anyway, we got on board Antelope, same sort of thing, put all our equipment in the, um, in the hangar at the back of the aircraft so that we don't have to carry it everywhere. And they showed us where the two bombs were. They, HMS Antelope had been hit that morning uh, by two aircraft again, both of which they'd destroyed. They'd shot them both down. The bomb had gone into the um, forward area, uh, port side, into the... Um, petty officer's mess and was sitting on a petty officer's bunk, just sitting there. If you'd have covered it with a blanket, you'd have thought someone was lying in bed. Absolutely. It caused a lot of devastation or damage on the way through, it ripped the guts out of the ship. So much so, so much so, that the ship couldn't manoeuvre. It lost all its, its electronics. So it didn't need to explode, but it crippled the ship. And unfortunately, that killed young Mark Stevens, who just happened to be in the way and got hit by a ton of steel and was killed outright. Um, so we decided that we couldn't deal with that one because we couldn't gain access to it. So we asked some of the crew members if they would actually start clearing the debris away so that we could get in to deal with this bomb. Yes. Where's the other one? They took us down to the refrigeration unit in, in uh, Antelope, she, which had come in from the starboard side. Um, and they'd wedged it with wooden wedges to keep it um, still. And they were the same bombs that we dealt with the same before. They were thousand pound general purpose British bombs. So we were confident again. Um, now one of the restrictions you have with carrying your kit on the back, on your back, is that you only carry a number, a number of cartridges enough for so many firings. You need two cartridges for each of the rocket wrench firing to create the Catherine wheel effect. So we were conscious we've got two bombs to deal with here. Um, we've got so many cartridges on our back, we're only going to have so many shots at this before going back and getting more kit. And that was all part of the thought process. Anyway, we did the same again, we informed the captain what we're going to do, we got the crew out, and they were coming out of every little hole and cranny you would think of, it's amazing. You know, little platforms in the, in the deck and they were coming out of this, and they're incredible. Um, and they were all put on the upper deck, flight deck and forward area. So Jim and I then started to get to work on this bomb. Did you at this point have any sort of feeling about it? Premonitions? What? Yes. No. No. Looking back, jumping about a bit, on the way down from Canberra, on Canberra, I was getting concerned about the heat, the equator and all the rest of it, because we were carrying detonators and they're susceptible to heat. And I said to the captain, where can I put my detonators? And he let me put them in the morgue which is on board ship. And the board on a ship is just a tube, a refrigeration tube. And Jim was very edgy about this. Now, whether he had premonitions or not, I don't know, but I thought nothing about it. But looking back, you know, he was quite twitchy about the whole thing of dealing with a, a more. But there you go. Now, whether that was a premonition on his part, I don't know. Um, but we were dealing with what we dealt with the day before, so we were quite confident, basically. So we attached the rocket wrench in the normal way, two cartridges on, retired to a relative from safe distance, which in this case was about 30 feet away. Having bulked 
bolted down bulkheads and they've got six big clamps on them so we bolted them between us and the bomb and we fired electronically wait your, wait your sensible time and it's my job to go forward as the team leader to check that all is well well when I got there all wasn't well what had happened was the rocket wrench simply spinned off spun off sorry off, off the pistol now I, I know why the it spun off is because the pistol on this particular bomb was badly damaged and I didn't want to clamp it on too tight because I would be doing what it was designed to do and it would probably set it off. So I had to be very careful on how tight I clamped the rocket wrench on. So I thought, okay, that's the reason it spun off, no problem, I'll tie it a bit tighter next time. So I went forward again, put the rocket wrench on, clamped it down a bit tighter. Same thing, no result. Um, simply spun off. Now that's four of my cartridges I'd used. So we did it again, it spun off again. So that's six of my cartridges. Now I'm thinking this is not good because I've got another bomb to deal with, I've only got limited cartridges in my pocket, in my, my satchel, I'm going to have to change my technique. And the technique we decided to change to on this particular occasion was what they call a de-armor. And it's a forked mechanism. Because although the rocket wrench was spinning off each time I tried to extract the pistol, it was dragging it out a little more and it was creating a gap between the pistol and the bomb. So my theory was that I would put a cutting tool between that and just simply cut it off. And for that you only need one cartridge. Uh, and now we discussed it, Jim and I, and um, discussed uh, what we were going to do next. The choices, of course, were just dump it over the size as it was, you know, throw it out of the hole it came in, <coughs> which we didn't, we didn't think was a safe thing to do because it was armed. Or we did the de-armour, as we said um, before. So we chose the de-armour, which is a single cartridge. We informed the captain we were changing our technique, um, and then we went ahead and did um, set up the de-armour, and retired to a safe distance, connected the wires, fired the button. Took the cables out of the of the firing mechanism, um, put the put the Shrike exploder, which we used in those days, back into its case, and then there was an almighty explosion. This thing rocked rocked the ship. I mean, people tell me that they were up on the flight deck; they were knocked to the floor by the explosion. And Jim and I were only thirty feet away from this. Next thing I know, I mean, Jim and I, Jim was standing right next to me. And we looked each other in the eye, and then boom. Within seconds, I was floating through the air. Um, slow motion. I thought I was dead, basically, because it was, it was so tranquil. I was just simply floating. Um, and I thought, well, I mean, this is milliseconds, really. This is only a few seconds before I came around again. I thought to myself, well, if this is death, this isn't bad. There's no pain. There was no worries about family, no, nothing you know, that I hadn't done that I should have done. There was none of that worry at all. I was floating down this proverbial tunnel. And it was round, it was dark, but at the end of this tunnel, I know it's a cliche, but it's absolutely true, there was a circle of bright light. And the top half of it was, was sky blue, the bottom was green. And there was a silhouette of my father there. Was, um, who was waiting for me to arrive to get down the end of this tunnel. And if I got to the end of that tunnel, I, I obviously hit the bulkhead. Um, and I remember that sort of jolted me back to reality. I hit the bulkhead. And, and it's only a matter of feet flying through the air, but all that happened in that time in my mind. And then I hit the bulkhead, fell to the floor. Whilst I hit the bulkhead, I could see that my arm was damaged because it sort of flailed around, you know, under, out of control. So I knew that was damaged. And then I hit the ground. So what I did, I was still conscious, so I had a good feel around. I was feeling my legs were damaged or whatever, and I could feel no broken bones. So I stood up expecting pain, you know, broken legs or whatever. Nothing. Um, I knew my arm was damaged because it was just hanging loosely. My next priority was to find Jim. So I was calling out his name, and now we're talking about the ship is on fire now. I'm down in the, in, inside the ship, the ship is on fire, lots of smoke, all those sort of things. I'm in a strange environment, didn't know how to get out, etc. 
and um, couldn't find him at all. Next thing I feel is a hand on my shoulder saying, he's dead, follow me. So I did what I was told. You know, and this chap, the next Navy chap come down, he, he knew the way out, he was going to get me out of here. So I put my hand on his shoulder as he told me to do and I followed him through the smoke. And on the way to the hatch, the escape hatch, we had to go past Jim Prescott. Not a mark on him. Lying there. Which was good because I could tell his mother later that he wasn't blown to pieces, as you would imagine. Um, still had his glasses on, everything, just normal. Um, I followed this chap to the, the escape hatch and um, he opened the hatches, went to push, but it wouldn't go because the crew was standing on it on the flight deck. So. And there I am standing behind him watching this fire and this smoke thinking, you know, we've got to get out of here. Uh, eventually, they, they got the message that the, the things were moving under their feet, so they got out of the way and we came out of the escape hatch. Um, it was dark by then. And um, they said to the, the chap behind me, they said, make, make, you know, look after him, watch his arm, he's damaged his arm. You know. And then the ship's doctor came over, who by pure coincidence, his parents lived just around the corner from where I lived in Kent. Crazy. Um, bit of small talk. I knew exactly what they were doing, because I was medically trained as well, you know, first aid trained. I knew exactly, you know, keep them talking, and all the rest of it, all the small talk. So they were chatting to me, and I was responding. They put a tourniquet on my arm, uh, gave me, we all carried our morphine around, an Omnipon, I think it was called, and morphine around our necks, and one of the chaps took one off and gave me a jab in the thigh, and then put an aim on my forehead, which is, you know, I knew exactly what they were doing. It was a basic principle. I now, I now know that it was the first time I'd ever done it, but, you know, you don't know at the time because uh, he was one of the medics. And the doctor was chatting away and um, I just sat there thinking, get him out, let's get Jim out. Go and get Jim out. But they wouldn't. That's not the way they do it in the Navy. You know, he's confirmed dead, they leave him there. I and I sat there saying to myself, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. Because I knew if I'd lost consciousness, you know, I was losing a lot of blood, I knew that. I just kept saying to myself, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to die. Anyway, after about... 20 minutes, half an hour, trying to fight the fire. The captain decided it was too much and uh, called the abandoned ship. Now I abandoned ship with the rest of the crew over the side of the flight deck into a landing craft. Foxtrot 4 it was called, the landing craft, um, which also suffered later in the war, but that's another story. Um, the lads came right alongside. Now these boats are plastic. And they melt in heat. And I was lying on a stretcher looking up at the ship burning and I'd seen nothing like it in my life. The aluminium was floating down like burning paper. It was horrendous. And they kept counting the crew to make sure they got everybody off that was coming off. And they, could, they were miscounting all the time. And I'm lying on my stretcher thinking, we've got to pull away from this ship because there's other bombs on board, there's ammunition on board, it's going to go. Eventually they were satisfied they got everybody on board. So the crew of the Antelope via Foxtrot 4 were taken to um, Ajax Bay. And it was in the time of being transported to Ajax Bay that the ship exploded. And it's the explosion that that photographer took a picture of, which is a famous picture of the Falklands, where you see the silhouette of Antelope behind the um, actual blast. Now nobody that's going to get off, everybody had gone by then. I mean, the only two people were Jim Prescott and Mark Stevens. Um, so we'd all abandoned ship by then. But we were very lucky. A, because these Foxtrot 4 and the coxswain had the courage to come alongside to pick us up, knowing that his ship was in, in danger anyway from the pure heat, um, and then take us off. Um, he was killed two days later. He was bombed, actually. Foxtrot 4 was bombed later. 